Hey y'all, hope you're doing well. Today we're going to cover chapter 13, which is the brain. If you have not covered chapter 14 and watched that recording yet, then please go ahead and turn this off and go back and watch chapter 14 first. We're going to do these two chapters out of order. So I want you to watch chapter 14, which is the spinal cord, before you watch chapter 13, which is the brain. We are going to build the spinal cord into the brain, and so we need to learn a little bit about the spinal cord. If you have already watched that, then um, I would love to tell you to go to the Professor 77's YouTube page and watch a video about the brain for lab so you can kind of know some anatomy before we start this physiology lecture. But unfortunately, he doesn't have one for the brain. So I will review that and I will do that in class and I will also try to get a um, presentation up a recording up of that information as quick as I can so you can review it but if that's available before this um, presentation before you watch this presentation then maybe go ahead and go watch that lab for the brain first as well <coughs> and then that way um, you kind of know the anatomy before we start this physiology now let's don't forget what we looked at in the spinal cord in the previous chapter the spinal cord was just basically a bundle of neurons, bundles of neurons, and we've got some gray matter and we've got some white matter. Remember, the gray matter is where we're going to have the processing in the spinal cord. The, it does not do any voluntary thought, no true thinking the way that we define thinking. And so the spinal cord just does things automatically. And so we call what the spinal cord does with its gray matter reflexes. So it's a pre-programmed response. So the gray matter really just functions for reflexes in the spinal cord. And the white matter is mainly um, sending up and down to and from the brain. Now today we're going to look at the brain and we're going to see matter and white matter. But we're going to see different regions of the brain. Each one of these regions of the brain has their gray matter and their white matter. The white matter is simply sending information to and from other parts of the central nervous system like from the spinal cord to the cerebellum or to the cerebrum. Or sometimes the white matter is sending information within areas like within the cerebrum we might link vision and sound and smell to get a bigger picture of what's happening around in our environment. And so the white matter still are pathways and we're still moving things in and out but now we're going to have gray matter that's going to be able to do a little bit more thought a little bit more true voluntary thinking and so in the brain this gray matter is getting a lot more complicated in other words so that's really kind of what we're going to focus on when we look at the brain without looking over any anatomy yet then I want you to the brain becomes more advanced as you go up right so the spinal cord the brain really kind of evolved from the spinal cord so the spinal cord has a lot of reflexes so the bottom of the brain is still kind of just modified spinal cord the brain stem is towards the bottom and the cerebrum is closer is at the top and so the brain stem is really kind of modified spinal cord. So again, what its main function is going to be are mainly reflexes. So when we look at that, the brain stem is mainly our autonomic, our most important reflexes tend to be housed there in that brain stem. In that medulla oblongata, right? So we talked about that part real quick in a previous um, presentation. Now, the... As we move up, we get more advanced, but we also kind of get into a little more specific functioning. Above the brain stem is a component called the diencephalon, and the diencephalon is kind of the central region. If we slice the brain right down the middle, um, front to back, and we look in the middle, we're going to see the diencephalon at the top of the brain stem, and before we get to the noodles, <clears throat> which are the cerebrum. So the diencephalon is really kind of what connects the brain stem and the spinal cord with these other two main parts, with the cerebrum and cerebellum. So we're going to find out that the diencephalon is really kind of a switchboard for the um, computers, which are your cerebrum and your cerebellum overall. So the cerebellum is kind of a little bit behind the diencephalon, actually a little bit behind the brain stem. The cerebellum is small and smaller and it's kind of under the noodles under your cerebrum the cerebellum is really involved 
with motor patterns, advanced motor patterns, learning motor patterns, um, to be able to do hand-eye coordination in sports. This is where the cerebellum really excels. So it's going to take a lot of information from other motor regions and it's going to refine it. And so it's going to make sure that your motor patterns are as refined as possible. And so cerebellum really deals with motor overall. The cerebrum are the noodles. That's the majority of the brain. And this is where we have the highest function. This is where we have our conscious thought. This is where we create our voluntary thoughts, our voluntary movements. This is where we observe. This is the ending for the sensory pathways. And so this is where we observe vision and smell and, and, and uh, sound. And so um, the cerebrum is really where our highest functions are going to be located. So when we're looking at the brain, we're going to divide that joker into four main regions. Again, brainstem, diencephalon, cerebellum, and, brain, and cerebrum. Now, in the long run, we talked about the spinal cord, you know, having these neurons, bundles of neurons. Um, and the spinal cord has got a lot of sensory and motor neurons because they're kind of sending information into and out of the brain. Once we get to the brain, though, we're mainly dealing with the interneurons. And if you remember, the interneurons make up 99% or so of the neural tissue. And these guys are really kind of like the circuitry inside of your computer, inside of your, inside of your brain. This is what creates the circuits that make everything function properly, these interneurons. So it does act kind of like your CPU of your body's computer. Again, this is really kind of what the gray matter is doing. Okay, so let's talk about that. Gray matter is where we got cell bodies and synapses. This is where we're going to have processing and decision making. Here in the cerebrum, this is where true thinking is going to take place, right? So voluntary thoughts, you changing your mind and thinking about something different is where this is taking place, right? Voluntary thoughts. When we look at gray matter, though, in the brain, we've got two main areas, two main regions where we see it. If we're on the surface of the brain, especially, for example, the surface of the cerebrum, the cerebellum, then we'll talk about the cortex of that region. The cortex is the outer layer, the most superficial layer, and this does tend to be made of gray matter. So a lot of times the inside of the cerebrum and the cerebellum, it's mainly white matter. And then the outer covering is going to be gray matter. And this is where we're going to get a lot of that function, a lot of the processing. If we have any regions on the inside of the brain, not on that superficial layer, but inner regions, we call those nuclei. So there, we are going to talk about some of these nuclei that have um, specific functions inside of your brain that are doing something different, but we're processing. We're not simply just passing signals like in our white matter. There's going to be some regions on the inside where we're going to be thinking as well. Now let's talk about that white matter. This information isn't discussed very much in the textbook, but I want to hit you with this because this helps to make sense of things a little bit better. Don't forget white matter axons. These are the pathways in and out of the gray matter, in other words. So this is how we're bringing sensory in, taking motor out, but this is also how we're connecting and creating these interneurons. So how do we connect to other areas of the brain or other areas of the spinal cord? There's three different ways, three different types of fibers or th three different types of tracks that we can have. There's association fibers, and association fibers will connect regions within the same hemisphere. So within the right hemisphere of the cerebrum to connect vision and sound together to get a bigger picture of, of what we're seeing and hearing in front of us, then that's going to be association fibers. If we need to connect things between hemispheres, and so sometimes we need to connect between hemispheres, we call it commissural fibers. And we actually talked about one of these under the spinal cord. We talked about the gray commissure. And that's an example of a commissural fiber. If we're going to connect different parts of the brain, either the brain stem, the diencephalon, the cerebrum, or the cerebellum, or we're going to connect those regions to the spinal cord, then we're going to use projection fibers. So the first two are kind of within a region, within the same hemisphere or between hemispheres, dealing with the cerebrum and cerebellum mainly. But then we can also have projection fibers that connect the parts of the brain to regions of the spinal cord or to other parts of the brain itself.
Now that we know a little bit about the gray and the white, let's get into the main bit of this presentation and let's kind of move up. So our textbook is kind of ordered a little odd for me. Again, I want to start at the basic and build it up to the more advanced. So I'm going to start closer to the spinal cord and move up to the cerebral matter as our ending because that's kind of how it evolved and that's how it's getting more advanced with its function. So let's begin with the brain stem <clears throat> since it's very similar to and it's right above the spinal cord. It truly is just kind of modified spinal cord. It's an expansion of the spinal cord. Whenever we look at the brain stem, it's white matter. Its main function as far as white matter is to connect the cerebrum and the diencephalon and the cerebellum to the spinal cord. So in other words, connect the other parts of the brain to the spinal cord. Everything that goes in and out to one of these has to go through the brain stem. So bi-directional passageway. That means sensory is going up and motors coming down all at the same time. Again, we're going to have a couple of gray matter kind of functions. We're one of the key features here. Again, I mentioned cranial reflexes. These guys are dealing with our most important reflexes that keep our organs going, make sure that we keep breathing, our heart keeps pumping without us thinking about it. So here in the brainstem we're going to have those autonomic centers and basically autonomic is really just controlling our most important reflexes. Okay. Also we're going to have nuclei, we're going to have gray matter on the inside dealing with many of the cranial nerves. And we haven't hit those cranial nerves yet. And I'll mention those towards the end of uh, this presentation. I may actually do a separate presentation with those. And so these cranial nerves, they're the mo 12 most important nerves and they connect to the brain. And these guys um, provide things like vision and sound and, and uh, you know, uh, taste and other types of senses. They also control a lot of our body. So, in the brainstem, we start at the lowest with the medulla oblongata. We move up to the pons and then move up to the midbrain. So, these are kind of the regions from superior down to inferior of the brainstem. Here we can kind of see they're pointing out the midbrain. Here is a view that we see noodles, there's the cerebellum. Excuse me. There is the cerebrum. The noodles are the cerebrum. Underneath it here might be a better view. Underneath it here is this smaller structure that is the cerebellum, kind of striated. And then whenever we look in the center, we see this structure here. And this structure here is our diencephalon. And um, the diencephalon is that routing center. And so there's only one area left and that is this top of the spinal cord that kind of just gets expanded and there is the brain stem okay now if we zoom in I want to mention this because I'm going to use this term a lot forever if you zoom in right here on this view I want you to notice that right here this part of the diencephalon kind of looks like an eyeball and then right here kind of looks like a little beak if we had it drawn it's going to be w shaped and then right here we got this hairdo this all honk hairdo so what it looks like is kind of an eyeball with a beak and some hair it looks like an elvis chicken oh home pretty mama i'm talking about the elvis chicken and so the diencephalon i'll talk about that all the time and i'm going to call it the elvis chicken and then whenever we see each other outside of class 10 years from now we're just chilling and we pass at a restaurant, I'm going to point to you, you're going to point to me, and we're both going to say, Elvis Chicken, right? Because we're going to remember that. We'll never forget it, all right? So there's our four main parts. Again, what we're looking at here is this brain stem. And when we're looking at the brain stem, and we can kind of see all these other views, there's this bulge, and then there's a bulge below it. So there's the medulla oblongata, there's the pons, and then there's the midbrain or the mesencephalon. So first, let's talk about that midbrain, and let's talk about that mesencephalon. First off, we are going to see a couple of main things. One thing we're going to see is called the substantia nigra. And again, nigra here is a Latin term referring to black. And so this region 
is kind of a darker region. I'm going to flip over and then I'll flip back. But check this out. Whenever we look, you notice in this picture, find the darkest thing that's black, and there is the substantia nigra. So this region, and again, here is kind of our view. Here's our Elvis chicken a little bit better. There's his beak. Here's his eyeball. There's his hair. Oh, pretty mama. And so it looks kind of like an Elvis chicken. So Elvis chicken's neck is really the midbrain and Elvis chicken is the diencephalon and so whenever we look here we can see that up above and there's the pons and there's the medulla oblongata so up above it we've got this region so we've got this substantia nigra and then another area that we're about to talk about is this region right here that's more whitish and it's towards the back and this is called your tectum or also called the capora quadrigemina and we'll see that term in lab so here's substantia nigra it is darker I do want you to know that it makes dopamine this is its important feature it makes dopamine Do so dopamine involved and involved with pleasure disease and the problems with dopamine in the synapse is not working properly then we're going to have the tectum or the capora quadrigemina so the tectum or the capora quadrigemina this structure is really for two of our main senses and I've keep talking about vision and sound these are two of our main ones and so what we see here we have something called the sensory colliculi the colliculus and so we have a superior colliculus or superior colliculi which is a pair and then we have an inferior colliculi which is a pair of these the superior colliculus controls your visual reflexes and tracking so for example visual reflexes if all of a sudden there's a flash of a firework up in the sky then you're gonna turn your head real quick if you caught it out of the corner of your eye and you're gonna to turn towards that firework just to catch that flash same kind of thing the inferior colliculus colliculi deals with auditory reflexes so here again if you hear a loud bang all of a sudden then you turn to face that bang to see what that was so this is what we call an auditory reflex so these two the visual and the auditory reflex are housed in that tectum or that capora quadrigemina so the midbrain deals with those two components as we move on we're gonna move down because they go not up which is unfortunate but we should kind of move up the pines is next the pines has two main features that we're going to talk about so the pines is kind of this bulge pines means bridge and so it's the bridge between the spinal cord and the rest of the brain so we have first off the cerebellar peduncles peduncle is a lat is a latin word it's a, a any word actually a uh, peduncle is the stem of a flower and so what that's telling us though is that this is white matter this is the stem that's leading to the flower this is not the flower itself so this is heading to the cerebellum um, and this is really just um, axons and neurons that are just heading connecting the pines to the cerebellum the pines is going to do some basic movements, um, some subconscious motor patterns, some that we don't think about a lot of times that we might just do. So some of our internal movements mainly. And so it wants to communicate with the cerebellum also because it kind of coordinates more advanced movements. So some of our basic movements, we're going to turn them into more advanced movements in the cerebellum with these peduncles. The other thing is this pontine respiratory center. Pontine just refers to the pons. So of the pines, there is a center that's going to help control breathing, help control respiratory. Again, we're talking about motor with the pines, and so here, skeletal muscles of breathing. So this is really what keeps the diaphragm and your external, external intercostals moving in order to keep you breathing and keep that air moving in and out. Again, that pines is this bulged area, kind of the first main bulge that we see, the biggest bulge that we see. 
moving up before the brain. There's a smaller bulge, bulge below it, and that's going to be our medulla oblongata. So here you go again. There's the pons, and below it is that medulla oblongata. So let's move over and let's talk about that. The medulla oblongata is the, is the most inferior portion, and inside of it, it has a little hollow region called the fourth ventricle, and the fourth ventricle is a hollow space inside the brain, and we haven't talked about this yet. We'll see this in lab a little bit more, but the ventricles are hollow spaces inside of the brain, and we're going to um, use cerebrospinal fluid in those regions to keep, excuse me, to keep them alive, and so or to keep those cells happy. Again, all tracks between the brain and the spinal cord has to go through here. One of the main things besides that white matter, here's its gray matter, maintaining autonomic nervous system. Okay, so setting and maintaining the autonomic nervous system. And again, I should have put gray matter out beside here, but I forgot to. And when we move on, here we kind of see that medulla oblongata. But here are the ways where I put the gray matter. Um, here's the autonomic control that I was just talking about. First off, there is a cardiac center. The cardiac center controls how fast the heart goes. So it controls the heart rate. It can speed it up. It can slow it down. But the medulla oblongata tends to set that pace right there. It also controls the vasomotor center. So the vasomotor center is located here too. Vasovessel motor, talking about movement. So here, this is what's going to control the diameter of a blood vessel. And we can use that to control blood pressure and control kind of blood volume in the long run. And we'll get into this when we get to 211. These are real 211 topics. But we can control heart rate and we control vasoconstriction and vasodilation with the vasomotor. Again, we've got another respiratory center, the medullar, medullary respiratory center instead of the pontine. So we've got two of these. We've got one in the pons and one in the medulla oblongata that are really kind of controlling the breathing rate overall. In the medulla oblongata, we've also got some others. So we've got some irritants, some coughing and some sneezing is programmed here. So if you get something irritating in your respiratory tract, then it's going to cough or sneeze. Salivation is kind of triggered here as well. Swallowing reflex is kind of triggered here. This is where it's housed. Gagging and vomiting. So here again, what we're looking at are things involved with respiratory and a little bit of digestion, okay, as far as controlling. So we've just shown that we're controlling cardiovascular, respiratory, and digestion here, and that's a lot of our autonomic nervous system. As we move up, we hit Elvis chicken, and that is the diencephalon. And the diencephalon has a few features, the epithalamus, that we're not going to talk too much about. The two key features are in the hypothalamus. Again, when we're looking at this, the diencephalon, I always like to think of it as a switchboard. Okay, It is a relay and a switchboard center um, information coming in. This is where we're going to plug it in and send it to the right place. So sensory going up or motor coming down. This is where we're going to arrange that information to make sure it gets to the proper location that it's trying to get to. Okay, the diencephalon also has that hypothalamus that controls a lot of our visceral activities. It controls a lot of autonomic stuff along with that medulla oblongata. Again, here's Elvis Chicken. Here's his beak. The beak is the hypothalamus. The eyeball is the thalamus. And then we see this structure right here. I don't think we're going to talk about it too much, but his hair is the corpus callosum. And so the corpus callosum, I'll go ahead and tell you, these are commissural fibers. This is a way to connect the two cerebral hemispheres is with this corp corpus callosum. Again, when we look at this, especially with this little choroid plexus, almost looks like eyeshadow, kind of gives us this Elvis chicken kind of appearance, right? So there is our diencephalon. The epithalamus, I'm not going to focus on too much except for one main region, which is towards the back. This is containing the pineal gland, and it is called the pineal, not pineal, because it's named after a pine cone. So the pineal gland, it's located towards the back. Here, I'm going to come back over here. Right there's your pineal gland. So there's the pineal gland, and then right above it is the habana 
habenular nucleus. Sorry, sometimes that's tough to say. So there is the pineal and the habenular nucleus. And so we can kind of see those forming the epithalamus. The pineal gland does make melatonin. It uses light to stimulate it to make or not make melatonin. So when you do see light, you don't make melatonin. When you don't see light, you do make melatonin. The more melatonin builds up in your body, it makes you go to sleep or makes you wake up. So we call that your circadian rhythms, your day-night cycle. Habenular nuclei, this is going to become a component of the limbic system. So it helps to relay signals from limbic system to the midbrain. Your limbic system is involved with your emotions. And so it takes your emotional response, kind of sends it to your consciousness area, the midbrain, and get, gives you real conscious awareness. So this is also involved with responses to odors. This is kind of interesting, but odors are one way that you can trick people into doing things that they usually wouldn't do because odors start to elicit emotions more than other stimuli for some reason. So we are triggered by smells very easily. Um, our memories are triggered very quickly and our responses to that smell in a previous So fear sometimes, um, fear is something that can be triggered very quickly by smells, which is kind of weird. But your mood, you can somewhat control with some of those smells, which is kind of where they extrapolate aromatherapy from. But as we know, aromatherapy a lot of times is really not scientific and it has no proof that it actually works because it truly doesn't for a lot of it. Now, here again, there is the regions that we're looking at. So this is going to be our thalamus in the skull, in the brain. Here the thalamus is our main relay point for incoming sensory information. I want you to know that. So most of what the thalamus does is it's the relay point for incoming sensory, especially our basic senses. So our basic senses we're going to call the somatic sensory area, somatosensory. And so we're going to send this information to the primary somatosensory cortex. And we're going to talk about that here in just a second. We're going to see where that's located there in the parietal lobe. And so that's where your basic senses are going to register. If it's a special sense, it's going to go to a different cortex, but if it is a any other sense besides your special sense, then it's going to go to the somatosensory area. So that's the reason I call them your basic or your general senses. The thalamus is also a filter. So this helps to filter out noise. That's what we like to call it. But if you're here, it gives an example of if you're in the middle of a busy restaurant, then you can filter out that noise and still focus on a conversation or focus on studying that too. The hypothalamus is really active. It does a lot of stuff. Again, this is Elvis Chicken's beak. It's held on to the pituitary, uh, or excuse me, it holds the pituitary off with what's called the infundibulum. So first off, we need to be aware that the hypothalamus is going to link up with the pituitary. And this is actually where we're going to start 211 too. We're going to talk about how these two work together to control our endocrine system. So we're going to see that the hypothalamus is going to have tons and tons and tons of options. Again, here is Elvis Chicken's beak. They're trying to show it to you in purple. There's the pituitary. There is the infundibulum. And then there is the thalamus. Okay, so they're trying to show you different things, but they're not really labeling it. Again, let's look at some of these functions. So it is the master controller of autonomic. So what it tends to do is it tends to control the medulla oblongata. The medulla oblongata and the hypothalamus work together. A lot of times, medulla oblongata might set the baseline. Hypothalamus adjusted. So it adjusts the autonomic nervous system to help influence things like heart rate and your blood pressure, digestion, and respiratory, just like we mentioned just a second ago um, with the medulla oblongata. It's also, as I mentioned just a second ago, the master control of the endocrine system. So I don't like the, it's, this is not the master gland. The pituitary gland is the master gland, but this is the, this is the, um, 
this is the control center for the endocrine system. And so this control system, the control center of endocrine is going to control that master gland, control the pituitary. And so we'll talk about this again when we get to 211. But you might want to be aware that the hypothalamus also makes two hormones. It actually releases these hormones at the posterior pituitary. ADH, antidiuretic hormone, and oxytocin. You've probably heard of oxytocin. You've probably heard of the fake version, pitocin. This causes smooth muscle contractions, and so this is what induces labor naturally. Pitocin is used to induce labor unnaturally, right? And so by the doctor. The problem is pitocin doesn't trigger the right muscles for labor, so it can cause some issues. So you definitely should just have the baby when it's ready unless there's some complications. Um, ADH, antidiuretic. I always break it down. What does a diuretic do? Well, it makes you go use the bathroom. Well, what would an antidiuretic do? It makes you not go use the bathroom. So in other words, ADH keeps water in your body. Okay, it keeps water inside. Your hypothalamus is your thermostat. It helps to regulate your body temp to make sure that you've got your constant 98.6. Hypothalamus is going to be involved with what we're going to call the limbic system. Here's another time that I've mentioned it. Limbic system is involved with emotions. It's involved with motivation. So your emotional behavior and your motivations overall are controlled as well through this hypothalamus, along with some other components. This is where your hunger center, control of food intake, and your thirst center, water intake, are lo located. And so this is when we get hungry and when we get thirsty. This is the parts of our brain that trigger that to actually make us go do it. This is also going to work with the pineal gland. So this is going to help work with the pineal gland to regulate some of those circadian rhythms in that sleep-wake kind of cycle. Okay, so again, a lot of different functions down there in that hypothalamus. Um, at that point, we've kind of wrapped up, and again, the key is going to be for the diencephalon, more of that epithalamus with the pineal gland and hab habenular nuclei, um, the pon, excuse me, not the pons, but the, uh, the thalamus, and then the hypothalamus, right? So these guys are the main components of the diencephalon. Then we hit the cerebellum. The cerebellum is the second largest part of the brain, as it says here. It's all involved with movement, right? Movement patterns, fine control of our muscles, and also storing movement pattern. So here is muscle memory in other words, right? So playing sports, playing a musical instrument, either one of those, it's advanced movement, movement patterns, motor patterns. And so the cerebellum is where we store a lot of these muscle memories and a lot of our ability to do better, right? Shooting free throws. It's stored here. You pick the ball up 10 days after you shot your last free throw, you miss a couple, but then all of a sudden your cerebellum remembers that pattern, and you start to start to hit them like usual, right? So there's a good example of that cerebellum. Again, large region back here. I mentioned that it's smaller than the noodles, but still it is the second largest area. Um, and so we can see it in several different views there, the cerebellum. Here's a great view. Show us. There is the gray matter, right? It's kind of brownish. And then on the inside is the white matter, these arbor vitae. So we can see the white matter kind of connecting to other regions. And then the gray matter is where we actually create those advanced movement patterns. Again. Coordinate, fine-tune our muscle patterns, make sure that we follow the correct movement. As we previously learned as babies, we didn't, right? And so we're building all this to learn how to stand up and walk. And then once we start walking, and then once we start playing sports and doing all these crazy things, right? So voluntary and involuntary, right? So we're kind of streamlining, kind of fine-tuning all of this. Okay, most of these movements were, are going to be initiated by the cerebrum. We haven't got there yet, but the cerebrum is kind of the master of this whole thing. And so the cerebrum sends down to here, and the cerebellum kind of refines it, makes sure that it's, it's proper as far as it's not jerky, it's nice and smooth. Um, part of muscles is maintaining our posture, right? So maintaining your posture, keeping your head up maintaining your equilibrium. So very important cerebellar functions there. It receives information 
from your muscles and your joints about what they're doing. We call that information proprioception or proprioceptive information. Again, it's telling you about the muscles or the joints. In other words, it's telling you about your body's position, right? What is your body's position? Are you sitting? Are you standing? Are you laying down? Um, but then whenever you close your eyes, you don't just drift into outer space. You know that you're still sitting or standing or laying down, right? So this information is programmed there into the cerebellum for input. Um, receives a lot of sensory and sends out a lot of motor. It monitors the muscular activity, and that's just kind of what we've already talked about. Here's a nice little view kind of showing you. Here's our voluntary movements, right? So our ability to actually think and then make our body move comes from the frontal lobe. We sit down through the pods and maybe back and forth to the cerebellum to fine tune it before it actually heads all the way down and out of there. Okay. Um, I'm not going to go into details here, but drugs and alcohol, they're going to affect the cerebellum. They're going to um, cause issues. Here we can see gait, so how we walk. It's going to change how we walk we actually move. Um, loss of balance and posture, again, this is part of what they're testing for um, whenever they do a sobriety test, for example. So disturbance of gait, sir, can you walk that line? You know, if you can't walk that line because you're kind of wobbly, well, your gait's messed up and they can identify that. Same thing, they're testing your balance and they're testing your posture, right? And then inability to detect proprioceptive information. Here's what they do when they close your eyes and tell you to touch your nose, right? Just because you close your eyes doesn't mean that you should lose lose track of where your body at is in space. And so close your eyes, touch your nose, you should be able to do that normally with no problem. But on alcohol or drugs, then we start to see issues where you can't touch your nose with your eyes closed. And so that's really what those tests are doing is to see, are you under the effect of any of those drugs or alcohol? Now let's move on to our final region and where we're going to take most of our notes over this presentation is really about the cerebrum. The cerebrum is the most advanced region. It's the, we like to say it's the seat of higher functions. This is where we get our most advanced, most complex intellectual functions. Um, we have two large hemispheres. We have a right and a left hemisphere. And again, these guys look like noodles. Now, what do we mean by intellectual or higher functions? Again, intelligence and reasoning, the ability to make a decision based off of information that's right and that's wrong, right? And so that's a very important thing to be able to do. If you can't tell that somebody's lying to you and then know what to do based on what should be right, then your reasoning is not functioning properly, right? So you've got to have the intelligence to reason through all of that as well. So there is a major function, thoughts, to think about something, you know, to think about what you're going to have for lunch or what you're going to do this afternoon, or memories, memories of, you know, thoughts that you've had before or things that you've done before. And again, a lot of this leads to judgment, okay? So that's a major, major higher function is to is to judge something, to know right versus wrong, but also just to make those other judgments that aren't right and wrong, to make sure that you just make the right decision for your your future. Um, we're going to get voluntary motor. We're also going to get visual and auditory activities. We're also going to get um, smell. We're going to get taste. Uh, you know, we're going to get all that here in the cerebrum. Again, there's the noodles, the main part, and so this is really kind of the majority of the cerebrum. When we look at this, here's a couple of terms I want to show you real quick. This crack right down the middle is called the longitudinal fissure, and so we can see right here the longitudinal fissure is what truly separates our two lobes, our left lobe, uh, excuse me, our left hemisphere, left cerebral hemisphere, and our right cerebral hemisphere. If we look close right here, we can even see those frontal sinuses that are right in the frontal bone. That sounds headache, kind of crazy. Now, um, again, we've got tracks. This is white matter that's heading in and out. I mentioned how we may connect the two halves, the two cerebral hemispheres, is through that corpus callosum. And again, that was Elvis Chicken's hairdo, right? And so that bouffant hair kind of flying backwards. That's how we can kind of um, send information. So here's those two hemispheres. There's that longitudinal fissure. And then here we can see that corpus callosum, uh, that component of the diencephalon that is actually a bridge between the two hemispheres. 
some characteristics. Um, one of the characteristics about this is that it's not easy to point to a very specific noodle and say that right there on that noodle, this is what's happening. Okay, we can't assign precise functions to specific locations. We can give it this indistinct, indistinct boundaries. We can say that somewhere in the occipital lobe is where your visual cortex is located, but we can't necessarily point and say, boom, that is that right there. Okay, so um, some of these things are not easy to assign to a single region or a single area, right? And because if we cut on your brain, it dies, the tissue dies, then we can't really do much experimentation, um, you know, morally do a lot of experimentation. Intervention. Hemispheres are contralateral, right? They receive information from the opposite side of the body and they project motor to the opposite side. So sensory for the right side comes into the left hemisphere of the cerebrum and same thing, information sensory or motor for the left side is going to be there in the right hemisphere. Okay, so it controls the opposite side. There are some differences between the hemispheres, but not as much as people sometimes like to make it out to be. Sometimes, you know, psychologists have gotten involved with this, and they've really kind of screwed this up, and they claim that there's right brain versus left brain people, and that some people can't do math and science, and some people can't do this and that, and that's not necessarily the truth. Now, there's some functions that are only on certain hemispheres, and when we see that, we call that lateralization where one thing is only in one of the hemispheres and not in both. And so um, we'll talk about some of the different cerebral lateralizations like your handwriting and different things like that that are, are speech centers that are just found on one side or the other. Overall, when we look at the brain, um, we are over in Chapter 13. And so in Chapter 13, there's a lot of good images of that brain. Um, one of them, let's, let me just find a good general picture that you can kind of use. Um, we've got a, a lot of these on page 487 and 488 and 489 kind of have some general images. And those are um, all figure 13.1 on all three of those pages. So you can kind of see a lot of these regions of the brain there as well. And then we can move back into the cerebrum, and the cerebrum is covered um, with lobes on page 502 is a really nice color-coded image um, that kind of shows all of that and breaks it all apart. Kind of shows us all these different colored regions. Let me see if I can pull that up. Um, shows all these colored regions and kind of makes it a little bit easier. Okay. Now, um, that I don't have that, so I'm going to go back and just start this. So there are five lobes, five regions of the cerebrum, and we call them lobes. Four are visible, and one is deep, right? So we see four from the outside, and we see one that is deep. I want to go ahead and tell you, the one that's deep is called the insula. Insula is where we get the word insular, which means to insulate right, or to kind of protect and isolate away from everything else. So the insula is the deep lobe. It's kind of deep to the temporal lobe, and we'll talk about its function here in a second. But the other lobes are kind of named after the bones that are on top of them, frontal, parietal, temporal, occipital. So these aren't too tough since we already know those bones. I do want you to know this, though. This is super important. Each of these lobes have specific cortical regions. So they have specific cortexes, their outer layers of gray matter that process very specific things. So we're going to find out, for example, frontal likes to do movement, parietal likes to do general senses, temporal likes to do hearing and smell, and then occipital likes to do vision, insula likes to do taste. So we're going to see that specific things are, are located in each of these lobes. But then we've also got some fibers, some association areas. Remember, association means that they're linking within the same hemisphere. hemisphere. And so we can link these things together. We can link vision and sound and smell together so we can get a bigger picture of what's happening around us. Okay, here is the frontal lobe, and we can kind of see there's going to be this line right here, and this is going to be called the central sulcus. We haven't 
called it that yet. We haven't seen it because we haven't done lab. But in lab, we're going to see this groove. And this groove is called the central sulcus. In front of it's going to be the frontal lobe. Behind it's going to be the parietal lobe. But the noodle right in front of it and the noodle right behind it are two of the most important. These noodles, each noodle is correctly called a gyrus or gyri. And so we're going to see that this pre-central gyrus is going to be very important. But overall, the frontal lobe is under the frontal bone. This is where your voluntary motor comes from. That's super important. When you think about moving and your body moves, it started right here. Okay, most of that comes from that pre-central gyrus. That's where we have our primary motor cortex, and we'll talk about that in just a second. Other things up here, though, concentration and verbal communication, the ability to pay attention and to be eloquent whenever you're speaking to make sure that you can articulate. This is something else, decision-making, planning, and personality. If you have had psychology, then surely you've heard of Phineas Gage, right? This is one of the most famous psychological things that they discuss. Again, they got to go way back to get something. But Phineas Gage, he was uh, back in the like late 1800s or something. Then he was working on, with railroads, and he had a railroad spike shoot through his skull. It severed his prefrontal cortex. It kind of did damage to this region up here, the prefrontal cortex. They found out that he changed. He completely changed his personality, changed his training, his decision-making. He became a totally different person. And so here we learned through that, um, along with other things, you know, that there is decision-making, planning, and all that, the personality. The parietal lobe is back behind there, in the central sulcus, behind the central sulcus. Here is that postcentral gyrus. So you can see that term over there in bold, postcentral gyrus. This is that noodle right behind that central sulcus. Overall, the parietal lobe is involved with general sensory. Okay, so, so your general senses, if it doesn't have another lobe where it's located, then that sense, every other sense except for those, are going to come to here. And they're going to go to that post-central gyrus. They're going to mainly register there. And that's mainly a lot of touch and temperature and pressure and pain, things like that. And so here, um, that's where that's mainly going to be located. Or processed is in the, in the parietal lobe. The temporal lobe... Here, this is called the temporal sulcus or the lateral sulcus. And so this thing that kind of almost looks like an ear right here, this region, is our temporal lobe. And we're going to see that we're going to have the, um, the uh, olfactory. And we're also going to have the auditory regions that are going to register here, that are going to be processed here in the temporal lobe. The occipital lobe is really small because that occipital bone kind of starts right there. You can kind of see that dip, but it also covers the cerebellum. So it doesn't, it kind of only covers part of the cerebrum. So here the occipital lobe is very small. This is where we deal with vision. So this is where the visual cortex is located. This is where your vision is processed and your visual memories are stored as well. Okay, here if we get deep, and this is a great, check it out, we can see all this white matter, and then we can see this gray matter, right? So the gray matter, here's the cortex, the outer layer, and the white matter sending info in and out of there. Here's some of those nuclei that I mentioned, gray matter towards the inside of the cerebrum. So here's going to be some of those nuclei, but in the inside, and we can even kind of see this invagination right here, in the inside, there's this extra little lobe, and that lobe is the insula. And the insula, kind of deep behind that temporal lobe, and this is involved with gustatory, or the sense of taste. Okay, We're also going to see in the insula a little bit of memory, and so memory and taste can kind of be connected real quick as well. So here again, pre-central and post-central gyrus. There is that groove, and in front of that groove is the pre-central gyrus, and behind it is the post-central gyrus. So we can kind of see those. Those are very important regions, and I'll get to them again here in just a second. Now, the functional areas. I kind of mentioned the functional as I mentioned the structural. So the functional areas are what do each of those, those lobes kind of do, right? So when we're looking here, we're going to have something dealing with motor, possibly something dealing with sensory, and then we're going to have association areas. No matter what, I want you to always remember that the association areas are what link other 
cortexes together and give us the bigger picture. Okay, so association areas, they link other cortexes together, and they're going to give us a bigger picture. Now, when we look at this, our motor areas, how are we going to control the body? First off, controlling your voluntary motor functions. Basically, your ability to move your skeletal muscles comes from the primary motor cortex, and this is located in that parietal, oh, excuse me, in the frontal lobe, and this is the precentral gyrus. So I definitely want you to know that. The first area, voluntary motor, is in the primary motor cortex. And the primary motor cortex is located in the precentral gyrus of the frontal lobe. Sounds like jibber jabber. But what that tells us is that in the noodle in front of that groove in the center, then we're going to have the region that's going to light up when the decision is made to move your muscles and then that's going to show up on that brain scan, for example, that that's where it lit up and then the muscle is going to, it's going to contract soon after. So this is really where we voluntarily control movement, is at the primary motor cortex. Now, if this is that noodle, the precentral gyrus, this is called a humunculus, okay? And what this is showing us is the different areas of these noodles as we go down the side of the head, down the side of that precentral gyrus, we can actually see we've studied it well enough that we know if some of these areas control certain parts of your body. So moving your toes, you just lit up in that region. Moving your tongue, you just lit up in that region. Moving your hand, but look, what do we move the most? Okay, look at this. We move the hand and the face kind of the most. All right. That tongue, look at how much control we have over the tongue. The tongue has a whole lot of control compared to the rest of your body, right? And so, uh, or excuse me, your torso. And so in the long run, we can see the areas that have eventually more space are the places that we control more overall. Okay, so kind of interesting, this little view to show us where everything falls. Other motor areas. There's a speech area. This is called Broca's area. And so this is important for using muscles for vocalizations. Usually this is in the left frontal lobe. So it's somewhere in that left frontal lobe. Um, and I'll point it out. Um, and most people, sometimes it's on the right lobe. Um, but generally it's in the left frontal lobe. Another motor area deals with our eyes, keeping our eyes focused forward and binocular. And that's called the frontal eye field. And so this tends to be, again, towards the middle of that frontal lobe. And so this helps to regulate your eye movement, especially whenever we're trying to look at things at a distance or trying to read, for example, then that's going to come into play. So those are major motor regions. Now let's look at our major sensory areas. First, we have the primary sensory cortex or primary somatosensory cortex. This is in the post-central gyrus of the parietal lobe. So remember, in the pre-central gyrus, in the frontal lobe was our primary motor cortex. Now we have our primary sensory cortex right behind it in the post-central gyrus of that parietal lobe. So again, this is going to deal with any of the senses that don't have their own cortex. So touch, pressure, pain, temperature, and then knowing our body's position, right, that proprioceptors is really kind of showing us um, that these are the main senses besides taste, smell, sight, sound, right? So those other four have their own places in the brain, so every other sense comes here. Now there's the homunculus again. You don't have to worry about that, but it's just showing us here is that post-central gyrus in the parietal lobe, and again, what are we sensing more of, right? So where do we get the more sensation from? We get most sensation from our hand, our face, and our tongue than anywhere else. Right there looks like 60% of the total sensation in our whole body are from just those regions, hand, face, and tongue, right? And so that's really where we get most of our sensory input is from those regions. There are, as I mentioned, other areas that are more specific. We have the primary visual cortex is located in the occipital lobe, and this is where vision is going to register.
register. And we have the primary auditory cortex, and this is in the temporal lobe, and this is where sound is going to register. We also have the primary olfactory cortex, this is sense of smell, and this is also in the temporal lobe along with auditory. And then we have this weird one, gustatory. Gustatory is in the insula, and gustatory has to do with taste. So the proper term for taste is gustatory, and that is in that inner little island lobe called the insula, and that's where we house that processing for our taste. Now, this insula and this region of the olfactory cortex and the temporal lobe are very close to each other. And so they associate a lot of information together, taste and smell. And so that's the reason that these two work together whenever you're sick. Maybe you can't smell, and so you're not tasting things quite as well either. It's because these like to share some of their information to give us bigger pictures overall. Speaking of those sharing to get bigger pictures, that's what we call association areas. The association areas, they link places within the same hemisphere, so it connects these motor or sensory regions to each other and gives us bigger types of information interprets data, coordinates motor response, um, kind of integrates things with memories, but it gives us a bigger picture is really the key whenever we do these association areas. More powerful functions or bigger picture overall when it comes to sensory. The pre-motor cortex, okay, so this is in the frontal lobe, and this is coordinating skilled motor activity. So again, this is kind of working with the cerebellum to coordinate those and refine those learned motor patterns like playing the piano, playing sports, things like that. The somatosensory association area, this is what links that primary somatosensory cortex with other things, right? So it links it with other things. Here it's um, within the parietal lobe. We got the primary somatosensory cortex. Um, it integrates that sensory information, and it can help us, for example, to determine things that we can't see. So we can use our hands um, in a dark room to touch the things, and then we can help identify what it is. Right? Identify an unknown, an unknown object without seeing it, based on its texture, its temperature, or shape, something like that. This is old school um, haunted houses back in like elementary school or back in the day. We used to have this thing where we would go in, you'd go into a dark room, and they would say, here, touch the witch's eyeballs. And they would have grapes in a bowl with some olive oil on it, right? So they were kind of slimy and kind of moved around. And it was like, oh, those are eyeballs. Here, touch her brains. And they'd have like spaghetti noodles all squishy, right? So they're telling you what. To what it is, but they're tricking you by putting something else in front of you. So really, if they didn't tell you what it was, and you just sat there and felt it for a while, you'd probably figure it out a lot faster than if they tried to trick you, and then your brain was thinking it was something else, right? So that was part of that whole trick that they played on you, was to kind of trick your brain into thinking one thing with something else. Visual association area is going to, it's in the occipital lobe, it's just going to connect the visual cortex with other things. So connect it with auditory, for example, give us a bigger picture. Auditory association areas in the temporal lobe is just surrounding that auditory cortex, helps us to interpret sounds, store memories, and also again build that bigger picture, link it to other things. Um, we also have some other functional brain regions, right? So besides those um, association areas that were direct, we've got some of these other ones that build bigger pictures in a different way. And so one of these multiple association areas between lobes that are connected, give us a big one, Wernicke's area, spelled Wernicke, he was German, so it's Wernicke. Wernicke's area, language, recognizing understanding and comprehending spoken and written language, right? So this is going to work with that motor speech area to make sure that we speak properly, but we recognize and we understand, we comprehend it to begin with. And so our Wernicke's area, we train that pretty much, right? So we're trained more for English. Um, some people are trained more for Spanish. Some people are bilingual. So they've trained this to identify more than one language, which is very complicated, right? It's easier when we're younger. The Gnostic area, 
um, this is going to um, link a whole bunch, almost everything that we can possibly link together. This gives us the biggest picture, understanding of our current activity. So here is really how we realize what we're doing right now in this moment, right? And kind of comprehending that current activity. Here's some images. These are over here on page 502 and 503. These kind of screwed up, but you can take a look at these um, a little bit. Here, this is the view that I wanted to mention that shows you all of these different um, pre-central, post-central gyrus. Here's our visual cortex. Here's our association area. You know, so here, this is kind of showing us a lot of those um, components that I'm trying to talk about that we just don't have visuals for. So take a look at that. Here and there even they're even trying to mix these things together to try, try to show you how all these are working together. So again, you take a look at that. I don't want to waste time because it's going through all these and just giving you different examples. So go ahead, take a look, page 502 and 503. And there's a whole lot of these down here to kind of integrate all of this together. Now, to start wrapping this information up, we're kind of heading downhill now. Again, check that out. There's that corpus callosum. Really cool. There's the corpus callosum connecting this wider. Right here we can even see one, two, three hollow spaces. These are those ventricles. They're not really talked about in lecture. We'll talk about them in lab. But the ventricles are hollow spaces inside the brain where that cerebrospinal fluid is floating. So these are the two laterals and there's your third ventricle. Whenever you finally study them in lab, you'll know what I'm talking about. Okay. Now lateralization talks about different things on different sides of the cerebrum or the brain. Again, hemisphere specialization, we call it cerebral lateralization. And so um, some of our higher order centers are on, di are on one um, hemisphere and some are on the other. And so categorical hemisphere. So specialized for language abilities. Um, so this area usually contains both Wernicke and motor speech and usually it's the left hemisphere right and so this is where they try to start talking about right-handed and left-handed people and they try to start talking about how some people think differently than others you're a right brain or a left brain person now that is total hogwash they have been proven scientists have proven that over and over again and psychologists just keep trying to ram that down people's throat but a lot of that is just complete hogwash so in most people this this region for speech and all this for language abilities is in the left hemisphere Right, and so um, again, in most left-handed people with either hemisphere is categorical. Well, that doesn't mean anything because over here, most people is in the left. So left-handed, they may not be most people, but they're still people, right? And so some people may not have it in the left, but most people do, right? So not that big a deal. Doesn't mean left-handed people are different, right? The representational hemisphere, um, the other hemisphere is the one, again, this is what they're trying to say, that one's more dominant. This is more visual spatial relationship. So imagination, artistic, this tends to be the right hemisphere. This is how they start to say right brain, left brain. But again, this is not how it is in everybody, and this is not, you know, a, a scientific fact that this controls whether you're smarter in math and science or smarter in um you know, history and English, for example. And that's what they used to try to say. To be honest with you, they pulled that out. So, um, they, they researched this and they pulled this out and they actually linked it to sexism. And they said that, um, that this was almost a way to try to discriminate against males versus females. Oh, well, males are better at math and science and females are better at English and history. And that's not the truth. Everybody can be good at whatever they want to be at. It's just how you study. Some people are better at other things than some than others are, but we all have our difficulties and we all have our limits and we don't know them until we reach them, right? So you can't just say that you're a right brain or a left brain person. And that's what they're trying to say. The categorical hemisphere and the representational hemisphere and so that's what they're trying to break it down into okay these guys are in constant contact that's the whole point right that corpus callosum if these guys are always talking then you can't be right brained or left brained right so that's just not possible um this tends to develop sometime before you hit five or six and a lot of times they claim it has accordedness with the handedness right 
right-handed versus left-handed. And so again, this is where we get right brain, left brain. But again, we've learned that this is not correct because left-handed people aren't necessarily more of what right-handed people are not, right? So um, trust me, I've taught so many different students and they're all the same. Um, you know, everybody tends to learn a little bit differently, but a lot of students are very similar. And I don't know that somebody is a right brain or left brain person. I don't see that being presented until, um, you know, and I never really see it, but then I sit down and I watch you guys take notes in class and I see which hand you write with. And then I start to notice who's a left-handed person. And you know what? Left-handed people, they perform exactly like right-handed people. They have the exact same problems right-handed people do. And they have the same advantages that right-handed people do. So um, there's a lot of this that's kind of psychology-driven and not as much scientific-driven as well. Here we can start to see kind of that Wernicke and that motor speech area in the same hemisphere. And then um, some of the other information dealing with spatial relationships they're claiming is over in the other hemisphere. Um, but at the same time, some of this is true and some of it is just a little bit of an exaggeration, it feels like. Um, the, a uh, stroke, let's mention that real quick, a stroke or a CVA, a cardio, a, excuse me, a cerebrovascular accident. Um, and so this is where you have not enough blood supply to the brain due to a blockage or who knows whatever. It could be due to hemorrhaging. You could just not have enough pressure in the body. Um, this can cause brain tissue death if greater than 10 minutes. So again, um, we talk about a lack of oxygen to the brain and you've got five minutes to live. Well, you've got five minutes to live. You can still live, but you may not live as comfortably as you did before, you're going to lose features. You're going to have brain death. So you're going to start to lose features of your function, which is not going to be a good thing. Um, symptoms, blurred vision, weakness, headache, dizziness, walking difficulty. Okay, so you're going to start to see that. It's going to affect the opposite side of the body. If these happen um, briefly, then they're referred to as a TIA, as a transient ischemic attack. Ischemia means low blood flow. So it means transient it just comes and goes that there's a low blood flow issue right and so as a result you start to see some of these problems if you have some of those problems regularly then definitely talk to your doctor about it another functional area in the brain is called the limbic system and i've alluded to this several times the limbic system deals with emotions it's dealing with your emotions and your motivation the limbic system is not one system all by itself. It's really just a collection of certain regions of the brain that work together to provide the emotions, the experience of emotions and motivation because you're, how you're feeling tends to also dictate what you're going to do in life. So you do need to be aware that there's several components. The cingulate gyrus, this is one of those noodles, um, in the cerebral cortex it surrounds the diencephalon. Okay, so this one is going to help to link things together. Parahippocampal gyrus, again this is another noodle. Okay, this is going to help with the hippocampus. So let's find out what the hippocampus does. The hippocampus is really important. Hippocampus deals with memories. Okay, don't forget that. Hippocampus stores memories and this is where we form long-term memories. This is the only part of our brain where we can create new neurons. And so the current theory is that whenever we build, build a memory, we create a new neuron and we connect it. As long as we keep using that memory, then we keep reinforcing that connection. But once we stop, then that neuron dies and it goes away and we've lost that memory. And so that's kind of how we currently think about this process of memory. So the hippocampus stores our memories, but memories have a lot to do with our emotions. How did we feel in that memory is a lot of what comes up. You know, who I remember that day, I was so happy. Who I remember that day, I was so angry at you. You know, you may have those kind of memories and you may say that immediately afterwards. You instantly link an emotion without even realizing it. So again, memories and emotion are two things that are linked. Amygdaloid body, this is something that's very important. Amygdaloid body connects to the memories. But what it does is it's triggered or it triggers fear. It's involved with several aspects of emotions. It kind of stores memories with the emotional context, but especially fear. And this is the problem, is that humans can be controlled very easily by their fears. And we see that, right? We know that people do that in our society. 
if you talk about um, historically, we give these people the term tyrant, right? A tyrant is anybody who tries to control you through fear, through intimidation. And so we got to look at people in our lives and make sure that we get rid of these these people that want to try to rule us with fear. They probably don't have our best interests in mind. They're probably just trying to control you to have their best interests in mind. So we have to be careful with some people. There's a lot of people that we may look up to um, that may try to control us with fear. And we need to realize that that might not be the best thing to do because it's easier to control somebody with fear than control them with anything else. So, you know, we look at even some religious leaders to control their congregation with fear instead of you know the the positives of the religion right so they try to fear you with hell instead of talking to you about the benefits of just being a good person in this world right and doing what you're supposed to do for the right reasons and so same thing with our politics man our politicians we see people who are always trying to scare you into voting their way you know oh well these people are after you you know anybody that tells you somebody's after you then they're trying to trigger your fear and they're trying to make you defensive on their side and again it's not for your benefit they're just trying to get an army of people thinking just like them. So you have to be careful, right? You have to think for yourself and not allow these people to trigger your fears to make your decisions for you because that's really the worst thing that we can do is to be controlled by a tyrant, right? Now, I mentioned this before as well, that memories and smells are something that are intimately linked to. So the olfactory con components, the bulb, the tracks, the cortex, all of this are also part of our limbic system. So it's easy to trigger memories with smells. This is why um, sometimes you walk out and you smell springtime and you have positive thoughts about, you know, something that you did back in the spring years ago, you know, and you just kind of makes you happy. Um, this is, you know, certain odors can really trigger your emotions. It can make them calm. It can make them, you know, crazy. Something that our student disabilities office does is if you have trouble studying for tests, then they recommend that, you know, if you are part of the student disability program and they will let you test in their office and what they'll do is they'll give you a candle to go or, or they tell you to buy a certain candle and for you to light it and smell it while you're studying every time you study you smell that same smell be it a candle be it a spray whatever and then whenever you go into their office to take the test they light that same candle and so they're trying to get the odor of that candle to trigger your brain's memories in a positive way and to bring back up that information that you studied right maybe not emotions but they know that odors and memories are connected and so they're trying to trigger that so if you have trouble give that a try something that they recommend for students that that can't test in the disabilities office is a piece of candy something like a peppermint something that's got a definite flavor and so peppermint is what they suggest every time you're studying suck on a peppermint and then whenever you come into class and you take the test then pop in a peppermint and that peppermint helps to trigger those memories from when you studied because you've built those memories with that odor and then you can retrieve them with that same odor. So if you're struggling sometime, maybe give that a shot. It sounds silly, but hey, sometimes you're willing to try anything to, to get better results and that, that might just work. Okay. There's another structure called the fornix. I'm not too interested in, in that one. Um, it just connects the hippoc hippocampus to other things. It's just white matter, nothing crazy. And then there are some other nuclei that habenular nuclei is involved. Um, some of the thalamic nuclei are involved. So there's other components. The point is the limbic system, emotions, motivation. There's many different components controlled with fear and smells and memories is what really creates our emotions and our motivation okay so here they're trying to show you all kinds of these components but again it's not one specific thing there's a whole bunch of little components that work together all right let's talk real quick about the reticular formation talk about consciousness so consciousness um, awareness of sensation is really kind of what we're talking about the awareness that we're all in this together that we're all here now listening to this same presentation um, and voluntary motor activities so simultaneous large areas of cortex so here we're getting the 
biggest kind of picture as possible. Um, we exist on a continuum from either alert to sleep, right? Either we're awake and we're paying attention or we're asleep. And so um, whenever we're asleep, we're going to have depressed activity, but especially in our brainstem, remember that's the basic parts, our basic reflexes, they're going to keep on keeping on, okay? Now, here's just kind of showing you conscious dealing with sight and dealing with how it correlates down and it, and it kind of um, links everything together. Okay, I don't really want to go into too much detail with this, but <clears throat> just in case there's questions on the test, I wanted to mention this just real quick. Um, first off, fainting is just a brief loss of consciousness. Stupor is a loss of consciousness to the point where you're only aroused by extreme stimulus. Okay, so um, I used to hear the term drunken stupor. You know, someone's walking around in a drunken stupor. They don't even know what they're doing, but they are so unaware. But if you pour water on their head, then they're going to snap out of it, for example. You know, that kind of thing. Coma is a deep unconsciousness, profound unconsciousness, right? Alive but unable to respond. So definitely not the best thing. A vegetative state, again, without thinking and awareness of the environment. Some spontaneous movements, but there is non-cognitive brain functions. You are not actively voluntarily thinking. It's simply just your autonomic functions that are keep on keeping on. An E kind of like an EKG, but an EEG, electroencephalogram. This is how we can measure the, the electrical activity in the brain. Um, and we can measure those brain waves and see the different waves and what's happening. Um, and it can help us diagnose um, whatever might be happening with the person. So here, higher order mental uh, functions. We've already talked a little bit about some of this. Um, but one of the things that we're about to look at is memories. So memories and learning, because that's really what memories and is, is, is creating a learning process. And then learning should help us overall with our, our long-term goal, which is reasoning, making sure that we can make the best decisions. So we're going to use um, the court of the cerebrum again. We're going to involve multiple areas. So again, bigger, bigger picture kind of kind of concept. So memories, and I'm going to hit this fairly quickly because I don't want to I don't want to just kill you with this information. Um, this presentation has been long enough as is. Types of memories. First off, a sensory memory. This is what's happening right now. I am speaking and you are hearing and it's forming a split second type of memory in your head where you see it and then it starts to disappear. Forms important association based on sensory input but it only lasts for seconds, right? So this sensory memory, that smell whenever you rode by and you smelled a blossom, you know, a tree blossoming, you know, that lasts for a split second and then it's gone, right? If you reinforce that, then it becomes a short-term memory, right? So if you reinforce that, then we start to put that into our short-term memory. But our short-term memory, it may last a little bit longer, up to hours. And this is the problem. Most people, when they study for tests, they try to put it in their short-term memory, but there's a limited capacity. Only about 7 to 10 small pieces of information. That's one reason our phone numbers are seven numbers long, right? So seven pieces of information is about all that you can remember. So if you try to cram for a test the night before the day of, then you're only going to remember about seven major pieces of information, and the rest of it's just going to be crap, right? Because you've only got it in your short-term memory. Again, repeating that sensory creates short-term. Repeating short-term creates long-term. And so we can convert short-term into long-term if we repeat and we term that encoding. And so if we encode that by repeating it, then we have it for limitless periods of time, right? Um, and so long-term memory is after we've repeated it and repeated it and repeated it, then it starts to be stored in some of those association areas, right? And so um, we've got to get that hippocampus involved, but these guys are going to be stored in the association areas and they're, they're going to become second nature, right? Instead of... Um, kind of a short-term memory that we got to struggle to recall sometimes. Long-term memory just becomes second nature to kind of spit that out, right? So here's kind of that process again. Sensory input, we get a sensory memory. Um, it may be delivered to short-term. We may repeat it, and if we repeat it, then it stays in short-term. But if not, then it goes away. We fail to remember these things. If we don't repeat this, then, and we don't 
deliver it, regain, return. If we don't um, keep reusing that information, then it won't become long-term. So the more we reuse it, the more it becomes long-term information. Okay. Again, we've already talked about this with emotions, so I think we're good. All right. At that point, we have finished this presentation dealing with the brain. There's a lot of information here. Definitely take a look at some of those pictures, especially on 502, 503, kind of dealing with a lot of the functions of the brain. And study hard, and I'll see you on the next presentation. Thanks, y'all.